Spectre, said Scrooge. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what that man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no other in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on as to the end just now desired until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now is, is where my place of occupation is and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, <clears throat> and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering a churchyard. Here, then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place. The spirit <clears throat> stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which if persevered in, they must lead, said Scrooge, but if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed, he cried upon his knees. <clears throat> the finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit, oh, oh no, no. The finger was still there. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe, Hear me, I am not the man I was. I, I will not be the man I, I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand 
trembled. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Or tell me, I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. The end of it. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice could, would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with his spirit and his face was wet with tears. They are not torn down, cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all, they are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. His hands were busy with his garments all this time, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. I don't know what to do, cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath and making a perfect lacoon of himself with his stockings. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. I'm, I'm as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello there, whoop, hello. He had frisked into the sitting room and was now standing there perfectly winded. There's the saucepan that the gruel was in, cried Scrooge, starting off again and going round the fireplace. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right, it's all true, it all happened. Ha, ha, ha! Really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know what day of the month it is, said Scrooge. I, I don't know how long I have been among the spirits. I, I, I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind. I don't care. I'd, I'd rather be a baby. Hello, whoop, hello there. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Clash. Clash, hammer, ding, dong, bell, bell, dong, ding, hammer, clash, clash. Oh, glorious, glorious. Running to the window, he opened it, put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial, stirring, cold, cold, piping for the blood to dance, to golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells. Oh, glorious. Glorious. What's today, cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? He turned the boy with all his might of wonder. What's today, my fine fellow, said Scrooge. Today, replied the boy. Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. 
The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the poultry's in the next street but one at the corner, Scrooge inquired. I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me, returned the boy? What a delightful boy, said Scrooge. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, replied the boy. Is it? said Scrooge. Go and buy it. What care, exclaimed the boy. No, no, said Scrooge, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here that I may give them directions where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have had a steady hand at a trigger who could have got a shot off half as fast. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. I shall love it as long as I live, cried Scrooge, patting it with his hand. I scarcely ever looked at it before. What an honest expression it has in its face. It's a wonderful knocker. Here's the turkey. Hello, whoop, how are you? Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him short off in a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town, said Scrooge. You, you must have a cab. The chuckle with which he said this and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckled till he cried. Shaving was not an easy task, for his hand continued to shake very much. And shaving requires attention when you, even when you don't dance while you're at it. But if he had cut the end of his nose off, he would have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all in his best and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands. How do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It, it was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness, here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord bless me, cried the gentleman, as if his breath were taken away. My dear Mr Scrooge, are you serious? 
If you please, said Scrooge, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, said the other, shaking hands with him. I don't know what to say to such munificent... Don't say anything, please, retorted Scrooge. Come and see me, will you? Come and see me. I will, cried the old gentleman. And it was clear that he meant to do it. Thank you, said Scrooge. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted the children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything, could give, him, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon that he turned his steps, and in, in the afternoon he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? said Scrooge to the girl. Nice girl, very. Yes, sir. Where is he, my love, said Scrooge. He's in the dining room, sir, along with mistress. I'll show you upstairs if you please. Thank you. He, he knows me, said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining room lock. I'll go in here, my dear. He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in great array. For these young housekeepers are always nervous in such points and like to see that everything is right. Fred, said Scrooge, dear heart alive, how his niece by marriage started. Scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting in the corner with the footstool or he wouldn't have done it on any account. Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It, it's I. Your Uncle Scrooge, I have come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in? It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games. Wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. <clears throat> but he was early <clears throat> at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was, he was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello? growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? Uh, I'm very sorry, sir, said Bob. I, I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It, it shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge, I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a big dig in the waistcoat that he staggered backward into the tank again. And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. <clears throat> Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. 
A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken, and he clapped him on the back. A Merry Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavour to assist your struggling family and will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob. <clears throat> Bob, make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset, and knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins as have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God blesses everyone. The end. <clears throat>